In the last few days, the Ukrainian crisis has been escalating by leaps and bounds. If Vladimir Putin wanted to be at the center of world attention, he has succeeded in achieving just that. Last Monday, he sprang a surprise on the world by signing declarations of independence of two Eastern separatist regions of Ukraine, namely Donetsk and Luhansk. He also chaired a Russian security meeting and delivered a long-drawn speech intended to justify his stance regarding Ukraine. In his speech full of uh, historical rhetoric and nostalgia of the greatness of the USSR, with somewhat distorted interpretation regarding the eternal West-East conflict, he clearly showed resentment for the loss of Russian control over a number of former Soviet Union countries vis-a-vis -vis with the ever-expanding NATO's influence, which, in his opinion, poses a security strain on Russian Western borders. Reaction from Western powers to Putin's latest move was swift in accusing him of contravening international law, first and foremost, the Minsk Agreement. Immediate economic sanctions against Russia were planned and partly put in place by the USA, Britain and the EU in an attempt to prevent or limit military actions, which now seems to be heading for the Ukraine main territory. Considering that Russian troops have already taken over the newly formed Eastern independent regions. This is an appraisal of the situation by our diplomatic political analyst, Dr. Mihol O'Hurley. What began as a Russian threat against Ukraine has now engulfed the entirety of Europe in crisis. Last week's claim by the Kremlin that they would de-escalate tensions by withdrawing forces from the Ukrainian border turned out to be false. Western warnings that severe sanctions would be imposed if Russia once again invaded Ukraine went ignored by the Kremlin. Russia's proxy regimes in control of Donetsk and Luhansk engaged in a false flag operation over the weekend in which they released videos purporting to show Russians under attack by Ukrainian forces. The international monitoring mission along the contact line proved this to be false. Equally so, scientists have analyzed the metadata within the videos and have proven that they were created days in advance of the supposed events. Regardless, Russia's parliament, the RADA, asked Vladimir Putin to formally recognize Luhansk and Donetsk, which he did. Oddly enough, he used the very same instrument that Russia used in 2008 to recognize the supposed breakaway publics in Georgia, simply changing the name from Abkhazia to Luhansk and Siknavali region to Donetsk. The absurdity of Russia now claiming that the forces they are pouring into Luhansk and Donetsk are peacekeeping forces is clear for the world to see. UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez called Russia's conduct threatening and dangerous for the future of legitimate peacekeeping. Sanctions have now been imposed by the West, targeting oligarchs and Russian banks, but they are unlikely to have much of an effect. Although they will deeply hurt the Russian economy, Russia repatriated over $5 billion in December in advance of this operation to shore up their short-term cash needs. More so, these are the same kind of sanctions that were imposed in 2014 that have had little, if any, effect on deterring Russia from further aggression. Ukraine is now calling its country to the highest level of alert possible. These are dark days. Russia's actions are essentially a declaration of war against Ukraine. The navel gazing as how we got here and our dependence on oil, which will keep us buying Russian gas, fossil fuels and oil, despite their invasion of Ukraine, has reached the heights of hypocrisy. Europe is in trouble. Ukraine's existence is being threatened, and we now must wait for Putin to make his next move. I'm Michal O'Hurley with Diplomacy in Ireland, European diplomat, reporting for Euroworld News. We have reaction on the situation from Oleski Ruklenko, Ukrainian research scientist at the University College Dublin. 
what happened and what is going to happen. So uh, in short, uh, all time until now, uh, all the situation was developing towards escalation. There were uh, basically no uh, signs of uh, the escalation process or uh, that uh, something is going more into peaceful direction. So Putin didn't intend to invade quickly. It was his plan to do it step by step to check the world's reaction and to understand will world allow him to invade Ukraine freely or not. Now it's kind of the moment of truth in the nearest uh, weeks, I would say, or even days. It's really moment of truth because all the uh, videos which were shown now about acknowledgement of so-called people's republics they were recorded before in advance so it was all going according to the plan and now we are in a point of bifurcation where we go to war or not if uh, we will go until to much more large-scale war it will happen in the nearest weeks or even days if not the situation will be frozen at the moment it is now so uh, now really everything depends on how world will react and how Putin will react. So it's moment of truth, really. If nothing really happens in terms of escalation now, it doesn't mean it will not happen later because previous, because now when uh, Putin acknowledged uh, these so-called people's republics and, and uh, entered its forces officially there, although they were there all these eight years. Every day there will be formal casus belli for beginning a war because every day formally now acknowledged Russian forces and Ukrainian forces will be face to face firing each other and every day they will give a casus belli for full-scale invasion. So now it will be much more hard constant pressure, but will this pressure be translated into large scale war or it will be limited to the small scale war which is now it really depends on how world will support ukraine on the 28th of this month in england the last of the pandemic restrictions will be scrapped including isolation for those who test covid positive this has been decreed by prime minister boris johnson who believes that the pandemic is almost over and that people will have to learn from now on to live with the virus. The English will have to hope that he is right in his assessment for dropping all restrictions could turn out to be a gamble. But then again, gambles are something that Johnson likes taking. Non si poteva immaginare un esordio migliore di Usan Vlaovic, il centravanti serbo acquistato dalla Juve per oltre 90 milioni di euro nel mercato di gennaio ci ha messo solo 32 secondi per sbloccare l'ottavo di finale di Champions League sul campo del Villarreal con un preciso diagonale imparabile per il portiere avversario. Che la partita fosse difficile e che il Villarreal fosse un avversario da non sottovalutare lo si sapeva e la squadra spagnola lo ha dimostrato sul campo, colpendo già nel primo tempo un palo e arrivando poi al pareggio al 66esimo con Dani Parejo, su un clamoroso errore della difesa juventina, in particolare di Delict e Rabiot, che hanno lasciato libero l'attaccante avversario di fronte a Cesni. Un 1-1 che tutto sommato è accettabile per i bianconeri, non è da disprezzare, una Juve che ha sì concesso poco in difesa, ma allo stesso tempo ha evidenziato ancora una volta come in campionato le grandi lacune in termini di gioco, in particolare la difficoltà a creare occasioni da gol. Insomma, per passare il turno e per entrare tra le migliori otto d'Europa servirà sicuramente una gara di ritorno migliore.